Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the Biblical Symbols and Orthodox Iconography playlist of this YouTube channel and is entitled All Saints. Before we begin, a short prayer. A blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to the Triune God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so I am empowered to speak truth without error and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God, any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcomed into your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now let us begin the discussion. So the discussion is about this particular icon, the All Saints icon, beautiful Orthodox icon, and its association to the All Saints Feast. And we're going to go over the Epistle reading and the Gospel reading and this Orthodox icon in detail, seeing all the beautiful biblical symbolism present within it, Old Testament as well as New Testament. All right, so we're going to start with the Epistle reading. It's the Epistle to the Hebrews. In this slide, it's, as you can see, chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. On the right is a close-up of the upper left part of that particular icon. So let's start who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Obviously, you're thinking of Daniel chapter 6 there. Quenched the violence of fire. You're also thinking of Daniel chapter 3. That's um, you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the Son of God is first mentioned in the uh, Tanakh. Escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead race to life again. Understand Interestingly, you have Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament, both of whom uh, um, raised the sons of widows to life, resurrected them. And then, of course, you have it in, in, um, in, in Christ doing the same thing. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of, of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. So now let's look at this icon. So in the upper left there, there's King Solomon. Here there are a bunch of archangels. If you look closely, you can see they have those things coming out of their ears, which we talked about in a previous video. There we have the sun. Remember the sun was made on the fourth day of creation and the sun represents Christ. That's where the light comes from. Um, interestingly, and, and notice this, the sun came and the sun's gonna come again, first coming, second coming. Now, interestingly, you'll read in Old Testament about Lucifer, and many people obviously connect Lucifer with Satan, the devil, the Antichrist, etc. Now, Lucifer is the name of Venus as it rises early in the morning. Okay, Notice it has light, which is obviously projected light. It's not its own light. It's reflected light, right? Okay, so here's the thought. Again, imagine Lucifer connected to the Antichrist. The Antichrist comes before the second coming of Christ. Many people are going to believe who have who don't know Christ, who don't know what the sun really is. Imagine if you've never seen the sun and someone says, hey, look over in the east. There's something that arrives called the sun, and it's going to have light, and you see Lucifer, you see Venus rising. You might get tricked, right? Obviously, if you know what the real sun is, you would say that's not the sun. Anyway, um, what else do we have here? We have nine of the disciples there. You'll see in the front, kind of wearing that yellow gold garment with the blue undergarment, that's uh, St. Peter with the gray hair. And you'll see to his right, kind of in the corner of the group, kind of wearing a red-purple garment with blue again underneath with the little bald patch of hair up front, that's St. Paul. And notice the two of them are holding the church, you know, and that Peter and Paul were kind of the main apostles of the church. Below us, we have the church fathers and um, uh, wearing, those are the typical garb of a bishop, etc. Okay. Here, that is the, these are representing the, you'll see the, the you'll see the, these and some of the other images coming up. That right there is a man holding a book, and you'll see there's also going to be a lion holding a book in this slide, an eagle, and uh, an, an ox or something in, in, a, in, in some slides coming up. These represent the, the seraphim of Revelation 4. Uh, also kind of representing what you see with, with cherubim, I believe in Ezekiel chapter 1. Anyway, the, the man in this particular uh, image here, uh, older traditions, all of these are connected to the Gospels, okay, the four Gospels, that's where they're holding the books. So this man, older traditions connect him to Matthew, like Orthodox and Catholic, and newer traditions, for example, Protestants connect him to Luke. 
the, the, the connection to Matthew is that obviously Matthew's gospel starts by, uh, you know, describing the, the uh, 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 lineage of uh, Jesus, you know, a, a human, as a human. Um, now, the connection to Luke's gospel is that Luke's gospel, it, not in the first chapter, you know, Matthew's is the first chapter, Luke's gospel also has uh, a lineage tra tra tracing him all the way back to the Son of God, Adam. So, down here, you'll see a lion holding a book. Old traditions connect that to Mark's gospel. In that, early in Mark's gospel, you have the voice crying out in the wilderness. Um, newer traditions connect it to Matthew in that, uh, it, 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 again, you have the lineage in the first chapter. It doesn't go to, the, to Adam like Luke's gospel does. It goes to Abraham and it describes him as the son of David or a king. So this would represent the king in the newer tradition. Let's continue. Right, again, here is now that, on the right, is that upper middle part of the image. And let's continue in the gospel reading in Hebrews. Now verses 37 through 40 in chapter 11. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goat, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they should... That, she, that they without us should not be made perfect. This has to do with the idea of, you know, prior to the crucifixion and the resurrection and the harrowing of hell of Jesus Christ, right? Saved individuals, Old Testament saints, did not go straight to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom. And the thought was that was part of Hades, but unlike an area of torment, it was an area of comfort. All of this is described in a parable that the Lord describes in Luke chapter 16, the, you know, the parable of, of Lazarus and the rich man. All right, so, cause it, so the idea is they receive not the promise. The promise was they didn't receive it. They, well, at that, at that point, the promise was coming later. Now, we got it. That's why in chapter 40, having provided some better thing for us, because these are individuals, these are obviously believers following the resurrection. So when those believers die, they're going to go straight to be with the Lord. They don't have to be in, in some sort of, a, 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 you know, even though it was a place of comfort, some sort of holding area in Hades or whatever the, whatever the case was in this other spiritual dimension, that we don't have to experience that. And again, it wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't torment. Anyway, let's look at the icon in the center is Christ in glory. You see the O'on in the cruciform halo. You see him surrounded by seraphim, you know, six-winged, again, from Isaiah chapter 6. Um, uh, I noticed uh, two wings cover their face, two wings cover their feet, and two, with two wings they fly. Notice Christ is sitting on a rainbow. That's from Ezekiel 1. Notice at his feet he has these wheels of fire, also from Ezekiel 1. Beautiful, right? To his right is the Theotokos. To his left is John the Baptist. By the way, you'll see this many times to the right will be, it's sort of an idea, and also you saw this even with with. Peter and Paul. If you go back and you look, you'll see Peter is to the right of, yeah, Peter is to the right of Paul. Visually, when we look at him, you'll see Peter to, to our left, but, you know, he would be to the right. And so imagine Christ would have been there. You'll see Peter to the right of Christ, Paul to the left of Christ. You'll see the Virgin Mary to the right of Christ. You'll see John the Baptist to the left. What this suggests is being to the right is some sort of an internal thing. Whereas being to the left is an external thing. So from a Peter standpoint, you know, you can simplistically look at his Peter as the apostle to the Jews, like people on the inside. Whereas Paul is an apostle to the world, apostle to the outside. The Theotokos, you know, had Christ within her. She presented him internally. Whereas John the Baptist presented him externally to the world, you know, with his, um, with his baptisms and, uh, and, 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 and seeing the Christ and baptizing the Christ and, and talking, you know, pointing him out as the Lamb of God, etc. What else do we have? Right above there, we have the three archangels, most likely Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael. You know the one in the front holding the little, mir the little mirror with the, with the X in it, standing for Christos, is uh, Gabriel, which we talked about last. And the other two are probably Michael and Raphael. You can't necessarily tell. And if you look closely, you'll see again those little things coming out of their ears. There's Adam and Eve, and they're setting up Christ's judgment seat on earth for a second coming. Yeah, well, there will be judgment, obviously. Let's continue. All right, continue with the epistle. Now we're into chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. 
So notice this is describing now we are another blessing we have is we have witnesses. We have the saints in heaven. And, you know, if God so chooses, these saints can see us and we can pray uh, through them, ask them to pray for us. There, you know, obviously if we ask them to pray for us, there's nothing wrong with that. And imagine having pray, have, asking someone who's in a perfected state to pay for us, who's especially the Theotokos, right? Christ was a perfect man. Every good man loves his mother. Every good man will listen to his mother, right? Especially if his mother is perfected and her requests are perfect, right? So anyway, so these witnesses. Um, you can now just right now e easily see why this was chosen um, among the other verses we read for the, um, the All Saints Feast. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us of this life, right? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And again, you saw Christ in glory there. At the uh, previous image, you see just the edge of it here. So now let's look at the, the upper right part of the icon. There is David. Interestingly, even though David was the father of Solomon, David's usually presented with the crown as a younger man, and Solomon with the crown as an older man. More archangels, again, with the things in their ears. There's the moon. So again, from Genesis fourth day. So the sun represents Christ. The moon represents the church, the believers. We reflect. So we're in darkness right now, but we need to provide the world with light, We need, to re which is a reflection of the light. It's not our light. It's a reflection of the light of the Son of God and the triune God. There we have a bunch of Old Testament prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then the minor prophets. The eagle of John. Notice all traditions connect that with John. So, you know, the eagle is the divine, the son of God, and the divine, of course, you know, John's gospel jumps right into the divinity of Christ. You know, the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then down here you have the ox. And again, um, uh, in, in old traditions, it's connected to Luke's gospel, which begins in chapter 1 with Zacharias making a sacrifice, right? An incense sacrifice, but, you know, the main sacrificial animal in Leviticus chapter 1 was the ox. And um, other traditions connect it to Mark's gospel and look at it as, a, as, um, the, uh, as Christ being a servant. All right now on the right there we have the lower left part of the icon. And now we're into the gospel reading. Matthew chapter 10 here verses 32 to 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoso ever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So let's look at the icon. We have Abraham there. And guess who that is? That's Lazarus sitting in Abraham's bosom, again, hearkening to Luke chapter 16, the parable there. Behind him is the seat of Abraham. Notice they're all in white. And notice in the background you see palm trees. This, you know, surely can remind you of uh, Revelation chapter 7, where all these individuals come out of great tribulation in white and are having palm trees. And, and, and they're with the Lord forever. And he wipes away all our tears. There's a bunch of male, old, and New Testament saints. And notice there's even a young boy there. Right, here's the center, lower part of the icon. And again, we're continuing the gospel reading. Now we're at, still in Matthew 10, verses 37 to 38. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now what's cool about this is notice how it coincidentally lines up with the image. Because guess who that is? That's the good thief on the cross that Christ said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And there is the saints Constantine and Helen, who tradition teaches found the true cross of Christ, uh, the true cross of Christ in Jerusalem. And that very well represents paradise, um, or you know, the new heaven and the new earth that we have as something to look forward to. And then finishing off here, we have the lower right part of the icon. Uh, to the right there that we're going to get at. Let's finish the gospel reading. Now we're in chapter 19, verses 27 through 30. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. All right, what I think this refers to, if you look at the book of Revelation, in the chapter of 20, there's two separate judgments. There's the judgment before the millennium and then the final or great white throne judgment after the millennium. The first 
judgment talks about thrones, plural. I believe this is a reference to that. The sec that's in verse 4, I believe, of Revelation 20. And then the second great white throne judgment, singular throne, um, I believe is in, uh, also in chapter 20, verse 11. And I think that's referring to the judgment of the sheep and the goats from uh, Matthew chapter 25. So let's continue. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive it a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be made first. Now what I believe that refers to, now who were the first? The first were the Jews. Who were the last? The last were the Gentiles. So I think the last shall be first suggests, because it is true that even though, of course, the disciples and many, if not most of the apostles and you know the early the early the uh, church fathers were were Jews. It spread not you know mainly did spread among Jews, but it mainly spread among the Gentiles. So I think the last that shall be first are suggesting the Gentiles shall enter the kingdom first, and then the idea of the first shall be last. I think goes to again Matthew nineteen that verse twenty eight, and then Revelation um, chapter twenty verse four. Because if you look at that in Revelation, and Lord willing, we'll get into this in the eschatology section when we talk about Revelation 20, hopefully, and these different judgments connecting here to Matthew 19, Matthew 25, etc. I believe if you look at that judgment in 20 verse 4 with the thrones that the Lord's referring to here, I believe, it surely suggests that, that who's receiving life are people who were still on earth who did not take the mark and did not worship the beast. And if you if you look at, you know, 1 Thessalonians 4, and you look at Revelation 7, you look at Revelation 14, and, you know, this whole idea of the, the rapture, etc., it appears that those people who are going to be believers are probably Jews who convert during the wrath of God. You know, and this, I think, ref is going to reference the 144,000 Old Testament saints of Revelation 7 and 14, and the two witnesses which if you look at their miracles, surely could be Old Testament saints. And if that's all true, you know, like you know, people like Moses and Elijah, for example, if that's true, you can imagine if on earth, while the, the believers of Christ have been raptured out, which if that does happen, which I do believe it does, um, if that's happening, who's going to be spreading the gospel? And who are they going to, who's going to mostly receive it? Well, it looks like, and again, in the eschatology, we'll talk about this, it looks like it's going to be the 144,000 Old Testament saints and then these two witnesses, which very might be, you know, two um, uh, major Old Testament saints like Moses and Elijah, for example. Who would receive the most? Jews. So I think that's what that's referring to. Let's look at the icon. There's Jacob Israel. Again, Jacob who grabbed his older brother by the heel. His older brother Esau, Edom, was red and hairy. I think that's, that's us. And notice his red, hairy brother, red from blood, hairy being the lamb, Jacob grabbed his heel. That's what we're doing. Our older brother is Jesus. We're grabbing his heel, and he takes us through the water of birth, right, out of darkness into life. Isn't that beautiful symbolism? So we're Jacob. We need to grab our older brother's heel. And then Israel, he who struggles with God, right, named by the angel of the Lord God, right? That's in Genesis. Um, we're, that's, we're supposed to be Israel, too. We're supposed to struggle with God in this wicked world, uh, you know, uh, doing things for his glory, etc. And then notice what he's holding there. Jacob Israel's holding his 12 sons, right? We have what? Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah. We have Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and Benjamin. There they are. And then we have female Old Testament saints there. Beautiful. All right, there's the, there's the image. I pray I spoke truth and interpreted Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate if you could like, comment, share, subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Holy Trinity bless us all.